in many ways, the worst part of my J6 experience happened after my sentencing. Because when I started talking about it and I started making clear that I was not gonna allow this to destroy my career or my life, that I was gonna come back from this, I was gonna fight back, that's when they got nastier and nastier. And I actually, I keep saying, I think that the media, we all know that the media is what the media is, but they, they've almost become like they see themselves as a prosecutorial arm of the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, there were reporters from CNN contacting my prosecutor and giving evidence to my prosecutor and saying like, you should, you should think twice about giving him a plea deal. Have you seen this? And have you seen this? When have you ever heard of reporters doing that? Yep. They're um, the vanguard. Yeah. yeah. They're the vanguard trying to usher through, usher the proletariat through the revolution. Yeah. You I know? think there are so many progressives who go into journalism to be uh, activists. Really. Absolutely. They're not there to just present stories and give you a fact and let you draw a conclusion on your own. They want to control the narrative. And unfortunately, it's something that they've been able to do on all fronts, right? Yep. Journalism is not about truth, it's about their truth. Yeah. So when you were incarcerated after January 6th, can you talk about, about what that was like? Because you did the. Um, display at CPAC, was it the year before where you CPAC had, Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, in August. And I don't know if everyone knows what it was, but there was a jail cell. Right. Yeah. So I did essentially a performance art piece at, C at CPAC where we erected a life-size uh, prison cell eight by eight. I mean, the only difference is that uh, it had bars and our, an actual prison cell like the J6ers are being held in is concrete bricks and a metal door where uh, these people, many of them are in solitary confinement and have been for years. Uh, which is insane because that's, I mean, I was, look, I was in there for two and a half days, okay? Like it was, and in that two and a half days, I was also not let out. But by the time I got out after two and a half days, like I, I was, I, I mean, like my, my nervous system was like on fire. Mm -hmm. I was like, get me the hell out of here. If I had been there for two years, like these people are Which never going to be okay. Many people are still in Yeah, the they're never going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Like the, these people, they're they're going to be gone. Like there, there's no way a person can survive And that. they say they're doing this for their protection or like what's the justification on solitary confinement? Do you know? I, I think that they put them in a special ward, which they have said is for their protection, protection. But they, um, I mean, there's all sorts of excuses that they can use. They can say, oh, COVID or maybe somebody tested positive. Um, I, I don't know the justification necessarily for it going on as long as it has um i know that they're being treated horribly i mean there there have been beatings one person I, we keep hearing lost an eye i don't know if that's literal or if he was just blinded or what happened but apparently he had the hell beaten out of him um you know food that's being you know served to them inedibly and you know destroyed so they they, they don't have access to their lawyers calls with their families um it's really pretty horrifying. Yeah. But so I was kind of trying to draw attention to that cause. And unfortunately, because the right wing media uh, overwhelmingly is so cowardly and afraid to even talk about January 6th or touch this, which is another reason why it was so difficult for me to get as my story out as much as I wanted to. Um, very few in the right wing media actually covered my performance art piece at CPAC, which, by the way, was actually amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was actually amazing. I, I don't cool and different. Like, yeah. No offense to CPAC, but like you need new, fresh things. Yeah. I w and when I say amazing, I don't mean like I'm amazing. It was what I mean is that we had hundreds of people lined up to mm -hmm. see it because what I did was we erected a, a life size cell. I put on an orange jumpsuit and a MAGA hat, got inside it, and I kind of like sat in various poses, not saying anything and not interacting with the audience. I allowed them to come. They could talk to me. They could pray. They could do whatever they wanted to, but I didn't interact. All I had was a chalkboard on the black wall, and I would keep getting up and changing the messages to say things like, where is everybody? Why am I alone? What, you know, things like that. And then we had audio. Yeah, I was going to ask about the audio component. Yeah, so we had 20 or 30 wireless headsets, and people could come and they could put the headsets on, and while they were kind of looking at the visual, which was me in the cell, we we had three different channels they could switch between, which were the voices of real J6ers telling their stories about being raided by the FBI, by being abducted, by being taken and put in a cell and the charges they faced and what it was like going through the DOJ. It was very powerful and people were like weeping and watching this, it was amazing. And then of course, only the left-wing media was there. So all you heard about was this unhinged CPAC performance, you know, that was like a carnival. And yeah. at one point, Marjorie Taylor Greene did come inside and she held my hands and she prayed. And I mean, it, it, it was lovely. But a lot of people were unwilling to interact with what you had set up. 
Oh, no, no, no. I, from the audience, you mean? No, I mean like a lot of uh, conservative public figures that might be at CPAC, like Marjorie Taylor Greene went up to it. but She did. Um, yeah, there weren't that many uh, like uh, you know, big personalities that came in were a part of it. But I'm even just talking about the media. I mean, it wasn't reported on by Fox News or Newsmax mm -hmm. or I mean, pretty much anybody on the right so the coverage was you know we just got dragged so hard with them just, except on twitter that's where yeah. i heard about it because yeah. i wasn't there that year and like twitter was in love with it or at least conservative twitter was like this i is must so have missed those tweets <laughs> see i got see people would t i wasn't on twitter at the time and people would text them to me and they'd be uh. like this is just unusual it's different and i think especially for you know conferences people don't expect yeah. performance art but I think so many people have questions about what happened to the January 6th people, right? right? Like, even if you don't agree with the violence and you you don't support it, you, there are so many unanswered questions that I think a lot of people want answers to. And that's why I ask, like, why do you think it's that uh, people can't grasp that domestic terrorists are left wing in America? Because for so long we've been fed, you know, conservatives have guns, conservatives are violent, conservatives are right. this, that, and the other, like look at Ruby Ridge, look at all these things. Like there is a, an idea that because they want to be left alone or you know they're more interested in safeguarding their own rights, they don't want to comply with this larger narrative that conservatives are the ones who we have to be nervous about. Well, but see, I, uh, uh, sorry, that's yeah, what I think is, um, uh, is great about what Tucker's doing is that he's, it doesn't erase the imagery of people who you know broke windows or fought with police officers. Of course not, and nobody's saying that. Like nobody's trying to rewrite the narrative and act like the violence didn't happen. What we're trying to do is provide a little more nuance and context here, and also to point out, just because a person got arrested or charged doesn't mean that they were a part of the let's overthrow the government gang. Why? So, why didn't Trump just pardon everybody? I can't answer that question. He should have pardoned a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know about everybody, but a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I suppose, how do you get everybody's name? How do you, how do you, you know, well, and like, put out a call like, hey, if you were there, did, send me a Right, and when did these plea, deal, plea deals get signed? When did people go to trial? I mean, I know a bunch of the Proud Boys were just on trial for the first time this year. Did he, can you pardon someone before they've been officially yes, charged? Yes, you can. Convicted? I think you can. You can, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so he just didn't do it. Do you yep. think he'll talk about it going, like that's well, the thing about this coming Well, he said now they should all be let go. He's the he he came out on Truth Social saying following the, the release on of this Truth. footage, ev all of these people should be released. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, you know, I get very angry and very defensive about people making public statements about January sixth without effectively kind of like doing the due diligence or the work behind the scenes. Look, I can tell you, I have never been contacted in two years by any of these people who and. It's really frustrating. Um, you know, I have even heard Trump kind of give credit to certain members of Congress and talk about what amazing work they're doing on the subject of J6. And I'm like, no, they're not. Like, no, no, they're not. Ask any person who's gone through January 6th who's helping them. The answer is nobody. Yeah. Nobody's well, helping. Nobody's it, helping me. Nobody's they're, help they're, people affected by January 6th are helping themselves. So, like, when I went to the Proud Boys trial a couple in, in January, I sat with people whose family members are a part of this, and they're saying, like, well, we made our own groups, and we found each other therapists to talk to, and we found each other, like, resources, because basically no one wants to talk to us about it. We can't get any media outreach. And also, like, we are really dealing with what the effects of having someone incarcerated because of this, like, like we have legal bills, like if we wanna be in yes. trial and they're in trial in DC and we're from Nevada, right? Like we have to be here, we have to put our lives on hold somewhere else. Like it's an incredible burden, not only obviously on the people who are incarcerated, but on the other people who are affected by it. It's unbelievable. And I mean, the amount of money that it costs to go through something like this, I, I mean, it's, and these are, a lot of these are very poor people, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's not even a matter of, you know, well, this person should be paying their legal bills or whatever, but it's like, man, w one post on Truth Social saying, you know, everyone donate to this fund. I mean, we could raise $10 million in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now everyone's actually got representation. Yeah. Uh, for, for the time being, a lot of these people have very liberal public defenders who hate their guts. I mean, they're literally J6 defendants whose lawyers are making them watch Schindler's List, you know, and, and, and things like that so that they can learn to be a better, more compassionate human being. Is that real? That's a thing that really happened. 